the Grand Fork School Board Monday, November 18, 2019 at 6 p.m. in the Grand Fork City Council Chambers. With that, we do welcome and roll call. City Council, um, Pres President Sandy? Here. Ken Vian? Here. Sandy Marshall? Here. Jeannie Mock? Here. Brent Weber? Here. Katie Dockford? Here. Danny Weigel? Here. We have a quorum. Mr. Pomacino? Yeah, Amber Flynn? Here. Doug Carpenter? Here. Jackie Hoffer? Here. Jeff Manley? Jeff's not here. Shannon Mikula? Is she on the phone? She was. Okay, they're connecting her on the phone. Cynthia? Swap. Here. And Matt Spivey? is not here and Eric Lund is not here. So. Well, thank you. So I want to say welcome to the joint meeting between the Grand Fork City Council and the Grand Fork School Board. This is a fantastic opportunity for us to discuss some strategic priorities for both the school district and the city. I'm excited to discuss the various agenda items like growth, development, demography, workforce development, school resource offices, and mental health matters. And I want to thank Bill Palmasino, President of, of the Board, Vice President Amber Lynn, Superintendent Dr. Brenner for leading in a collaborative nature that you do. We all go farther when we work together and we are thrilled to talk about issues important to our youth and our community. One of the pillars of the Grand Forks Promise is a commitment to youth and it's exciting to see the dedicated team at the school district taking these issues head on. And I expect this to be the first of regular meetings between the two bodies, and I'm excited about working in a united fashion as we move forward. We have a number of presentations from staff members, and we'll follow a roundtable discussion at the end of these presentations. Mr. Policino, do we have any comments? No, we're very happy okay. to be here. <laughs> we're, and we're glad you're here. So now I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Phelan, item two. Mayor Brown and members of council and school board. Thanks for being here. Uh, I should say uh, it's been a pleasure working with uh, Mr. Brenner, or I should call him Dr. Brenner. And so um, I think one of the best decisions you've made is hiring Dr. Brenner to become your, our superintendent. So thanks for doing that because uh, we've never worked better together than we are currently with Dr. Brenner. So uh, thank you for Terry and your leadership. With that, we're going to try to hand off a few things. And so um, um, we're going to talk about growth development. Ryan and I are going to share that. We're going to watch a 10 minute video of your demographer. And then Haley Rosassen from our HR department is going to about, talk about some opportunities for us to work together on um, workforce development matters. And uh, I can't wait for this. Our, our terrific police department is going to talk about um, um, SROs and uh, the Impact Academy. And, and we're um, great to have Lieutenant Mo here to talk about that. He's got some great photos of great things that we're working on there. And then finally, Mr. Gockler is going to talk about. Um, the, the, the final piece, you know, the behavioral health and all the things that you guys have taken up. So I, we look forward to this. If Mayor, if you're okay, if we could go through all the presentations and then take Q&A later so we don't get stuck along the way, if that's okay with everyone. Yep. Okay. Um, again, I just, I already said that. Thanks, Mayor, for doing that. Um, the one thing that the city of Grand Forks um, is in charge of is trying to grow and develop the community. And so um, we take the leadership role in that. And really, uh, I have uh, um, my colleague Keith Lund behind me, and I think Barry was here earlier. So really what we're leading for is moving the community forward from a community development strategic initiatives. And you know, from a community development perspective, um, we're really joined in the fact of our K through 12 education is one of the leading community development um, things that we, we present to the community along with all the other great things that go on in our, we have a safe, well-educated community with really good schools. And so if we can't tell the story of that from a community economic development perspective, um, we're never gonna get down to the, uh, the third and fourth bullet there. So we really thank you for that. And that's really where we're leading the community in all the various aspects. The other thing we've worked a lot on is strategic in initiatives and that's workforce development. And Haley will talk a little bit about things we're working on work workforce development. It's not only the city of Grand Forks with the capital C, but all, a lot of community development groups that we're working with. So we always lead with that. We're gonna show you some strategic land and infrastructure development is when people come to town, if they think you've got a really terrific community, they want to know, well, where, where can I do something at? And if we're not ready to go um, in a short amount of time, they go on to the next community. And the final two bullets are really um, uh, low interest loans and tax incentives. Um, we got to do a lot to get them there, and really that's the icing on the cake uh, as we move forward. So just so you know our strategy from uh, number one to number four to try to make things happen in our community. 
The mayor is really proud of, of this is that um, at his last state of the city address, he talked about we're going to be a billion dollar uh, community investment. And um, he's going to have another state of the city in, on, in February of 2020. And I think we're going to be able to demonstrate that uh, we've met this goal. And uh, we've met it in large degree this year and, and next year already. And Mayor, you said it probably over the next five years, and I think we're going to beat that. And so really what we've done, and just can get a perspective, is sometimes all these things start going up, but, it, but a lot of these things are going up because it's been intentional, um, thinking of those first four bullets. And so um, when we get to some of the development, and I'm kind of speaking of this because we have to work on, on incentives and those sorts of things. Um, if you look at along our, our, our business corridor here, um, as you go from Iron High to Minn Kota to a lot of the business park developments from PS Doors to LM to Border States to Acme, our water plant and our new public transit facility. Those are all, we'll, we'll call it greenfield development where we've put in um, a, a lot of investment into those areas from water, sewer, storm um, water and transportation to get those developments <laughs> moving forward. And then on our Highway 2 corridor, you have Steffes, we have Simplot, everyone can see their high bay freezer going up, North American or I should say um, the Red River Biorefinery in the mill. So we have lots of commercial and industrial development, which we'd call greenfield development that has that have taken um, a lot of investment in our community to get to make those happen through land development and infrastructure development. The other thing we, we've done and really trying to be intentional is if you ever read a Moody's report about the city of Grand Forks, they'll focus on our institutions and, and uh, looking at institutions, Ultra is one of our institutions, UND, Grand Forks Air Force Base and they talk to city at large. And so we've really been intentional working with Ultra and UND to create a collaborative approach, promote investments, and I think that's been successful. And if you look at the downtown, really the, the, the kind of the three-part stool of this is UND, Ultra, and, and downtown and the community as a whole, we've been really uh, pressing forward. I'll have, um, from here, I'm gonna have Ryan talk about some of the incentives. We know we have the we have an incentive that's gonna come forward. We just wanna give you some highlights, kind of just remind everybody where we're, we're going. And then Ryan's gonna talk about the transition of kind of where we see growth. And I think that's gonna really buttress well with that video of your demographer. And I think we're really well aligned with that. So with that, we'll have Ryan go and then we'll hit the video. Thanks, Todd. So, Here's our, uh, our process in terms of uh, walking through a tax incentive. Uh, I won't go through each one of these points, but it's a two to three month process. The things I want to point out is our third party analysis that uh, the city has started uh, within the last year. Um, anytime somebody makes a, a request for one of these, uh, we do have uh, Baker Tilly, uh, which uh, does our finances uh, review uh, here for the city. We have them take a look at that request, make sure it's uh, um, that the uh, request is appropriate, that there isn't too much profit being taken. Um, and uh, we do that uh, review and then bring that forward to the local government advisory committee, uh, which is made up of uh, two members of the school board, two members of city council, uh, two members of the county. And we also have a park district uh, representative there for for seven total on that committee. Uh, they review that, that work and then uh, make recommendations back to uh, their main bodies. So um, with that, it, like I said, it's a two to three month process, um, depending on how long it takes for that financial analysis. Uh, here's a, one example of, uh, uh, of a project that did go through a process. Uh, this was prior to our local government advisory committee. Uh, it's University Flats. Um, it, this was uh, done in an area where the developer purchased a property. Uh, it was the value of that property, uh, the tax returns, uh, was down at this level here back in 2016 um, when that property was constructed. Um, they're still paying that amount today, um, and they had 100% through uh, the first five years, and then there was an escalating amount that came on. So in the year 2022, there's where their taxes will be and they'll continue to rise. Uh, so they'll be paying uh, roughly 20% of that new increment and then it'll continue to rise from there. That block, and it's, it's about three quarters of the block, I should say, uh, out to the year 2028, we'll be paying taxes. You know, they were at this amount and it's gonna be up here. 
So it's that increment additional. So there wasn't cash given to them. Uh, what we did is uh, we just uh, forgave those uh, that what that increment would be. Uh, we just uh, delayed uh, our, the entities from getting that that increment. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about a little bit is the downtown developments. So uh, we have quite a few of these coming in. Um, what you see, the investments here in blue will be public, um, or I'm sorry, private developments that are coming in. Um, the uh, recent one was the Olivan that we're hearing about now. Um, that should be coming up in the next few months. Uh, in addition, we also have on this map some green, some public infrastructure or public projects that are coming in, uh, Town Square investment. Uh, this doesn't highlight the uh, Demers Avenue project in and of itself, uh, but we also have some other uh, pocket park investments too that have gone on, um, and then the, the Herald building itself as well. Uh, in the future, we'll be having the water treatment plant site too, which we're uh, really excited for. Uh, that should be coming online uh, by uh, potentially in the year 2022, roughly. I also want to talk about greenfield development and how how some of those projects come on board. Um, here's the uh, a map of the city. Uh, this is our uh, 2045 growth tier boundaries. So uh, the tier ones that you see, uh, these are the areas that uh, the city will be developing out in the uh, next five to ten years. And so what you start to see is where some of these residential areas are starting to fill up. Even this map's getting to be three to four years old. Uh, some of these areas will, are really starting to develop and you'll see some maps. Here's uh, the discovery areas right in here, uh, golf courses in here, and then this is where some of those Thompson homes are going in now. Uh, and Crary has some other developments in there as well. And uh, we'll talk about that here in a bit. In addition, here's our strategic infrastructure growth areas. Uh, Todd had mentioned this a little bit about all those new uh, areas that were really going on were kind of on this edge here. The, that doesn't happen without the uh, tens of million dollars of in, uh, infrastructure development that uh, goes on. Uh, water, wastewater, storm water, and transportation. So that's uh, both streets and, and bike infrastructure, sidewalks, those types of things. All those uh, need to happen uh, for that development to occur, which then uh, uh, leads into our tax base growing. Um, again, uh, these mostly on the western edge and then down in this area and then we have some future um, probably a battle going on or a, a future uh, discussion in terms of 62nd Avenue that could be on the near horizon here's some of that area uh, specifically where a lot of that residential growth not all of it but uh, the majority is going on uh, these are the lots that are uh, that were available in 2018 that were going up 2019 as well uh, which is just this last year and then you can see so a lot of those available single-family lots this was at the beginning of the year a lot of construction has happened since then as well so uh, if we had an air photo more recent you would see even some uh, some of these areas starting to pop up with uh, homes as well so all, all this infrastructure came in uh, this year and in addition uh, Al would be, be able to do a much better job of telling you but a lot all that all that area is is, uh, is uh, filling in as well. Um, one other area I'll talk about, um, well, we'll get into that in the future as well. This is that 62nd growing through here. We still have some areas, but there's a lot of lots that are available and they'll start to fill up in the next year or two. Uh, we're still right around that 100, uh, a little over 100 lots, single family that are that are going up a year. I think now we're going to hit the video, uh, Mr. Brenner. Is it okay if I make Hello, a couple of comments like, before you start that? I'm not sure who's controlling the button over there. Is it Haley? Me? Maybe, maybe just don't start it quite yet. Oh, okay. Thank you. Just so I can uh, provide some context to this. I think everybody is uh, probably familiar that we're in the middle of a uh, master facilities plan, master facilities study, uh, looking at all of our campuses uh, across the community, including uh, Twining Elementary and Middle School at the Grand Forks Air Force Base. Uh, I think all of you are aware that we, we have some budget conditions that um, that are strapping our resources, and basically what's strapping our resources would be the conditions that our facilities are in. 
Um, Chris Arnold, our Buildings and Grounds Director, probably says it best when he, he says we're reacting to a lot of our catastrophic failures uh, in our schools. And so when we're in reaction mode all the time, it's, it's very difficult to get ahead, uh, ahead, of, ahead of the game in terms of facilities. So uh, we have a lot of data sets that we've been looking at uh, from a budget perspective, from a facilities perspective, uh, from a demographer's perspective. And uh, Rob Schwartz, um, he is the principal owner for RSP Associates. Um, and he has been doing our demographics over the last, I would say, seven or eight years. And with enrollment projections, neighborhood projections, where we're growing, where we're stagnant, and where we're actually losing some ground in terms of population. And, and I'm happy to say that he was only two students off this year. Uh, there are 7,500 student count. So uh, he's been pretty spot on. Um, as we're doing some planning for the future. The other thing, and I'll, I'll say just to echo Todd's earlier comments, uh, it's been a privilege to work with the city uh, to be part of Team Grand Forks. I was able to uh, spend some time with Team Grand Forks uh, during the last legislative session. And, and I think there's some awfully good synergy uh, that's been created and we can talk about common themes because at the end of the day, we're all competing at the state level. We're all competing for the same scarce resources. Uh, some would argue whether they're scarce or not, but uh, we'll just leave it at that. Uh, so it's been wonderful to be a part of that process as the city moves in terms of growth, uh, it's good for the school district to be working hand in glove. Uh, when you're talking about infill and greenfield, uh, we, we think it's important for us to be at the table and be part of those conversations as well. And I think, uh, I think a lot of good will come out of those conversations. So with that, uh, we've got about a 10 minute uh, voiceover presentation by Rob. And at this time, I, I'll just send around a, a two page handout that's part of Rob's um, slides that you might not be able to Hello, see very well Robert Schwartz, when it the talks Mayor when he Mark. talks about uh, the enrollment projections at certain buildings. So with that, whoever's in charge of that button, <laughs> feel free to hit go now. Thank you. Hello, this is Robert Schwartz, the owner of RSP and Associates, and I'm going to give you an overview of some earlier. information about the Grand Forks Public School District as it relates to enrollment yep. and capacity. To begin with, this chart here shows you the past enrollments, the solid red for elementary, the solid blue for middle school, the solid green for high school, the purple line is the aggregate of all three of elementary, middle school, and high school. The last five years, going from 1920 through 2324, which are pastel colors, represent the likely RSP enrollments for each of those years, broken out for elementary in the solid pink, the middle school light blue, and high school light green, and again, the purple line is the aggregate of all three, elementary, middle school, and and associates, and I'm going to give you an overview of some information about the Grand Forks Public School District as it relates to enrollments and capacity. To begin with, this chart here shows you the past enrollments, the solid red for elementary, the solid blue for middle school, the solid green for high school, the purple line is the aggregate of all three of elementary, middle school, and high school. The last five years, going from 1920 through 2324, which are pastel colors, represent the likely RSP enrollments for each of those years, broken out for elementary in the solid pink, the middle school light blue, in high school light green, and again, the purple line is the aggregate of all three, elementary, middle school, and high school. What you're able to see on this chart is in the 18-19 school year, there was just a little over 7,300 students, and we're forecasting by 23-24 that you'll have about 7,700 students. Um, and you can see again the breakdown of enrollment change at each of the levels, uh, the bulk of the growth will happen at the high school level. We also have prepared a map that's an animated map that shows you the heat density of areas within the area we've zoomed into of the city of Grand Forks 
uh, starting in 2004-2005 and going through the 1819 school year. As you're watching this video display, the areas with the greatest concentration of students is represented by the darker red areas. And then as it gets less dense, it radiates out into the yellows and then into the green. What you'll notice is that the population has uh, been moving uh, slightly throughout this time period. RSP examined a lot of different data from the school district, from the county, and from the city of Grand Forks to understand what was happening with land use. Um, so looking at zoning, looking at the future land use plan, and from all of that information, we generated areas that likely could see growth. We categorized them in three different areas. The green areas that you see on this map um, represent where we are likely currently seeing activity. The yellow areas represent where we might see some activity within the next five years. And then the purple areas likely closer to 10 years out. Um, we factored in again different infrastructure items, um, whether it was um, new lift stations, um, where the infrastructure was located, who owns the land. I'm even planning for um, the water treatment facility uh, area that's along the river to have some sort of redevelopment um, over the next five years. From the information that we put together, we generated what you will see on the next four tables uh, or next four slides is information that, uh, quite a bit of information about each of the buildings. So starting on the left hand side of this table, you will see each of the buildings. You will see the functional capacity that RSP provided for each of those buildings. And what's important about that functional capacity is it takes into account uh, the programs, takes into account the schedule, the class sizes, how those spaces are actually operating in each of those buildings to really get at the number of students that ideally could be contained within permanent physical brick and mortar for that site. As you move to the right for each of these facilities, we have the enrollment for the past years of 2014 through 2018-19 school year represented three different ways, and I'll explain that on the next slide. Moving to the right for 19-20 through 23-24, we've depicted the enrollment based on the attendance area, so where the student resides. Do they physically, if they went to school, would they be in that attendance area? As you move to the right, we also show that enrollment projection from 1920 through 2324, but looking at where would we potentially see students in seats as it relates to each of the buildings. There are two different shadings that occur on each of these charts. The orange represents where it exceeds the RSP functional capacity, and the green is where it would be lower than the 70% RSP functional capacity. This is important to note. Some of these buildings have more mobiles or portables that are um, located on each of uh, their facilities. That would not be part of our functional capacity. We ideally would say more permanent space um, would be ideal for the educational programs in your building. So if we look a little bit closer at what uh, the past enrollment means and how we have the different uh, enrollment categorized for each building, um, it's done three different ways. The middle row on each building is the reside. So do they physically reside in that attendance area? So we're showing for illustrative purposes, Ben Franklin, we can see if we go out to 2018, 2019, there's 345 K-5 students that resided within that attendance area. When we look at the bottom row, which is labeled attend, you see that there's 343. And so initially you'd say, wow, we had um, two students that went to one of the other elementary attendance areas. 
that is not the case. If we look at that top row um, that says res backslash or forward slash ATT, that means do they reside and attend as K-5 students um, in that particular year. So we look at Ben Franklin, 1819, there's 307 students of the 345 that resided and are attending that building. The difference between 307 and the attend 343 is a result of students already attending a Grand Forks school, in fact, an elementary school. Are they coming from another one of those buildings to attend Ben Franklin? We show this same information for the secondary. Um, and again, the past enrollment for 1415 through 1819 and then the future enrollment forecasted by RSP for the reside for 1920 through 23-24 and then by attend for 1920 through 23-24. And again, we show that breakdown um, so you can see for illustrative purposes for Schrader Middle um, how that relates. And again, we have 455 students that reside in that attendance area 483 that attends, but of that 455, only 432 reside and attend that building. Some of the other notes um, to help you understand um, what is happening with the enrollments and the forecast are further clarified on this page. And I think some of the other things we wanted to bring to your attention um, are with the capacity. I've already mentioned um, previously how we've gotten to our functional capacity and um, really how that student experience is going to be in that school and how we ideally want to maximize what that experience could be. That doesn't mean that when you hit that number that you can't have good education take place in that building, but it does suggest that when you go over that functional capacity, you may have to do different things in that building to accommodate the programs that are there or to accommodate what that experience could be for the students in that building. Um, we're recommending that you annually update that because some of the programs, some of the needs of the students change from year to year. So you may want to move programs. You may have to look at how some of these spaces are being utilized and creatively look to make some changes to, again, maximize that student experience. We also know with the forecast to grow specifically as we see it move to the south, um, that you're going to want to make sure that you have the appropriate space near those growth areas to accommodate having neighborhood schools for students that are moving into these emerging areas. So again, we appreciate um, your time uh, viewing this information. If there's specific questions about what I've discussed, uh, feel free to get with the district and they can provide me those questions and we will give some answers to help clarify what that may mean. Thank you. Billy, would you mind um, giving us an overview? For sure. Thank you for having me. Um, just wanted to talk to you quickly about the workforce development um, initiatives that we're doing right now at the City of Grand Forks. So last month we partnered with the local HR group and um, conducted a survey at, that worked at that looked at um, training needs in Grand Forks and helped identify what the current and future employee training needs are. Um, we had over 30 employers take this survey, um, and some of the businesses included Alltrue, Minkota Power, PS Doors, UND, and then also um, Retrax and Simplot as well. So what we found in this survey is that um, soft skills are still the most needed skill set um, that employers are running into um, with applicants and uh, the current employees. So as you can see in this slide, um, a lot of our soft skills include current, uh, communication, but also we're looking at um, some of the advanced skills as well that are needed. So these were the most requested trainings in that survey. Um, what we're going to do from here is we are hoping to work with local partners such as UND and TrainND and um, help develop 
different types of workforce programming that could be um, completed in for Grand Forks employers. Um, we also hope to help assist with finding expert matter, um, subject matter experts for these trainings. Um, and then also we would like to share this information, the full survey results with the school district so that they could help with preparing students for with the skill sets needed that employers are looking for. So that is the workforce training survey that was completed. Um, next is our workforce initiatives that we're currently working on. And we, over the last seven years, have developed a really good relationship with the University of North Dakota. And out of that came some workforce collaborations, such as the internship program. We're hoping to expand those collaborations and um, try to get students at the high school level as well. So that is our next goal we're going to work on. Um, we're thinking if we can tag them a little bit earlier, it'll help out with some of our recruitment issues. Um, our first issue, workforce initiative, is our job shadowing program. We hope to develop a job shadowing program that will um, be a formal program across all city departments that um, high school students would be able to just test drive different types of careers in local government. And then the next one would be our internship program. So right now we do have an internship program with the University of North Dakota and we would like to expand that to include high school students as well. Um, where students could be able to have hands-on experience in local government careers while potentially earning um, credit as well for graduation and it would also be paid. Um, we're hoping too that this would benefit the city by, di um, by expanding a diverse pipeline of talent for future employees and then also it help our current employees develop a little bit of leadership skills. Um, we are also hoping to test drive a, or we are going to be test driving a high school intern in our waterworks department this summer. So we'll keep you updated on the successes that come from that internship. It'll be our first high school intern, which we're pretty excited about. Um, the next is our career academy. So this is sort of a dual purpose and we're in the very infancy stages of this um, idea. And what we're hoping is that this um, career academy could serve two purposes where it would help with our workforce planning and then also with um, helping co uh, high school students who may not want to go to college right away after high school. And what they could do is they could take classes at this career academy on different areas such as equipment operations, mechanics, um, other hard to fill city positions um, while in high school and then after graduation hopefully they could come work at the city of Grand Forks. So that is um, one of the areas of service of that career academy. The second area would be actually helping our current employees develop some skill sets for promotional opportunities like leadership skills, um, communication and business writing to help with future promotional opportunities. Um, also, for with that too, with the workforce training, that could be available to small businesses that may not have the skills or the resources able to provide that training. So we would hopefully open it up to them as well. Thank you. And that really goes to Council Member Marshall. Um, she said a couple years ago, we're doing lots of training internal because we've tried to push human resources, we keep saying people are the most important part of the organization, but the way to demonstrate it is to have human resource lead a lot of the initiatives that we have. And so we've really changed that and, and uh, Council Member Marshall said something, we all were kind of inquisitive, you know, what, the, what, did, what did Council Member Marshall really mean? And what she said, you know, you're doing a, a terrific job internal the organization, but how do you move it outside the organization? So that what we're doing as a city of Grand Forks, um, we could help share across the community um, perspective. So that's what we're trying to move our, what we're doing internally outside the organization and just not help the city of Grand Forks, but help the city uh, lowercase c across the organization. And we've done a great job with UND and we think going down to the high school would be the next best thing that we can do to create a uh, dynamic and functional workforce. So thanks for um, Haley for that. Now, the next one is uh, Chief uh, Nelson. And Lieutenant Mo, you're going to lead the conversation, but we're really proud of our police department. You know, we think across the country, all the issues that some cities have with um, police departments, and we are, should be so proud and thankful for the great police department that we have in, in our community, in the safe community. So with that, Lieutenant Mo, would you give us some uh, a move on, on this? Absolutely. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to come and speak to you guys today. Uh, obviously, uh, we are proud of our school resource officer program, as well as the Impact Academy. 
Uh, to give you guys a, a brief b background, we currently have five SROs in the city of Grand Forks. We have three at the middle school level and two at the high school level. And the, the, the foundation of that program is based on the uh, NASOR, the National Association of School Resource Officers. Our officers follow that, uh, that, that, that course. Uh, they attend a basic SRO uh, uh, course and then they, they, um, their goal, excuse me, are to provide a safe learning environment, provide valuable resources to school staff and members, foster positive relationships with youth, develop strategies to resolve problems affecting youth, and protecting all students so they can reach their fullest potential. Also, our uh, officers are, are members of the North Dakota Association of School Resource Officers, and this is very similar to the national one, except it's in, within the state. Um, they have contact with other SROs throughout the uh, state, whether it's Bismarck, Fargo, Minot, um, and there's some others that are uh, county-based. But then they're able to um, share ideas, uh, practices, best practices, and of course attend me uh, quarterly meetings and trainings. I should keep the slides going here with me, sorry. Um, so, so to further expound on the NASRO concept, there's a triad concept, and basically that's the officers assisting as an educator, specifically a guest lecturer in some of the courses, informal counselor, a mentor, and then a law enforcement officer. They, they accomplish these goals, more specifically in my mind, in two specific categories, security and engagement. Uh, the security is not just uh, structural, it could be practices or best practices, uh, um, such as lockdowns within the schools, trainings, and then the engagement, engagement with the students, the school staff, and other community members. Getting into the security, when we talk about that, we think of what a police officer normally does. Uh, whether it's a crash, they take the crashes or, um, while on school property, uh, they ticket and properly park vehicles, they field criminal complaints, complete criminal investigations relating to school incidents to include thefts and fights on those types of uh, events, and then prevent illegal substances such as drugs from entering the, the school and the property. And again, like I said, that is what most people envision a law enforcement officer doing, just expanding that to the school campus. However, there's a lot of other things that they, they, they do participate in. Uh, more specifically, they are a constant police presence, presence to confront any assaultive threats uh, from within the school or from uh, outside the school. They are our link to secure a school location if we believe there is a threat to the school or to a person at the school from an outside source. They're the person we call to get that, that process going. Uh, they plan and organize lockdown drills to assess how the students and staff respond to emergency warnings. They are actively engaged in threats to the school or individuals at the schools through a threat assessment process. They actively participate with school staff in interviewing uh, suspects' parents to provide information which the assessment team can, can base their decisions on. And then lastly, they work with the school to provide additional security measures and resources whenever events arise. Some of these events could be a student protest or events similar to that. Um, additionally, for security, they, they prep. Uh, officers participate in safety and security meetings where they bring forward suggestions to better uh, secure the schools. One such example is, is viewing camera systems with school staff and making sure they are viewing the portions of the school and the outside of the buildings that they specifically want to target. They work with the school to test new safety technologies such as emergency apps, radios, uh, items such as that. They facilitate conflict resolution through restorative justice programs. They created and managed a text -a tip program uh, to receive anonymous, anonymous information. And of course, they have ongoing communications with other GFPD personnel regarding student issues. And what I mean by that is there are times that officers might uh, have, have a student or an incident and they are a good resource for them to, uh, to gain some further knowledge or best solve an issue. And this is the part that I really get excited about, is, it's the engagement, right? There's a lot of opportunities for us to have positive uh, uh, contacts and relationships with uh, students, and uh, that is a huge goal for us and, and our department. And of course, there's no better way to do that than in schools. So one of our biggest programs is the MIDDLE program. Uh, it stands for Managing Interpersonal and Day-to-Day -day Life Experiences. It's presented to every seventh grader in Grand Forks, and the topics include stress and coping strategies, uh, role of law enforcement in our community, social media, positive negative relationships, and drugs. Um, at an elementary level, the SRO, we have non-SRO officers that have committed to present to uh, a course in winning decisions to every fifth grader in the school district. And those topics include influences and actions, respecting others and their property, healthy relationships, and internet use and safety. As you can see, some of those are, are redundant in both of those courses, however, they are um, very important, significant courses or topics uh, that are contemporary in today's society. 
excuse me, additionally, we also have uh, alcohol, tobacco, and drug use for the Winning Decisions Program. And lastly, um, they're guest speakers. They present at health courses, government courses. Um, if a teacher requests something, they can usually come up with something, as long as it's relative, to help present in those courses. And then uh, further on with engagement, uh, they, they participate in a lot of events. Uh, they attend school events such as the Cushman Classic and school dances providing extra security and engagement uh, with the students. They assist in fundraising. Uh, one example of that was uh, Corporal Beth Scari at Red River. Uh, she has organized a police dodgeball uh, team to participate in the school's Dodging for Jammies event. Of course, uh, you know, it's a, a pretty exciting event. I'm not going to say that we we're very good at it, but it is a, a good time and a good, uh, good event. So we, a lot of us realize we're, we're not as flexible as we once were and we're getting older. So, um, and then of course our officers are engaged in youth, the, the youth by participating in pickup football games during recess and have taken pies in the face to assist in fundraising events at their, at their schools. Um, as you can tell, engagement is a huge part of our department and, and the schools. So with that, we, we started a new endeavor, and that is their, our, our Impact Academy. What we found out is there, there was a perceived need, and we, we sat back and thought to ourselves, um, who engages the youth throughout the summer when they're not in the school? Obviously, the school is fantastic at, at engaging the youth at those times. Those that aren't involved in any summer programs, we wanted to, to, to I guess, fill that, that, uh, that gap there a little bit. And uh, the GFPD believed a summer program would be a great opportunity to engage these youth. Um, our goals uh, of this program were to build trust with the youth, teach students to be role models, get involved with community organizations and volunteer work, and of course help students see the impact of their choices and decisions. And this brings us to those that we uh, tasked with this important um, endeavor. Uh, Corporal Thorlashis and Officer Farmer were selected for this initiative, and this was quite simply putting the right people in the right place um, and in my opinion, they did a fantastic job. They rocked it. The Impact Academy, for those that are wondering what that stands for, integrity, maturity, partnership, accountability, uh, community, and tenacity. So going back, we decided to uh, start this program and it ran from June 10th to July 25th. Uh, there were 19 sixth through ninth grade uh, students that participated throughout the program and graduated. Initially, there were more students. Uh, however, some did not follow through and uh, complete the course. Some of the projects that we are, some of the more uh, large projects that we are excited about was planting and tending to a garden located at the GFPD Annex. Um, this was an ongoing task. It, it was continuous growth. It was eventually something that would yield results, and that was some an ongoing lesson of, of the course and the project uh, throughout the whole uh, course of the, the uh, academy. It was a pretty fun, pr fun project, actually. And then uh, also they participated in business tours such as Cirrus, PS Industries, Rydell's. They went to the Northlands Rescue Mission. They also uh, viewed uh, some events going on at the Police Academy, uh, the, and they did a tour of the Police Department. They toured a Fire Department station, and of course, Juvenile Detention. They completed volunteering events such as uh, uh, St. Joseph serving lunches to community youth, um, in total, they assisted in serving approximately 1,300 lunches to youth throughout that summertime. Another huge uh, project that they participated in is a car wash. This car wash was a free will uh, donation event, and it led to an even larger project, which was our Random Acts of Kindness program. In order to uh, facilitate this uh, project, uh, they, they all spent time planning, organizing, and completing car washes. They raised over $423. Uh, it was matched by Hugo's for a total of $850, and they handed out 85 $10 gift cards to people that were going into Hugo's um, at, at that particular location. And of course, they had a lot of fun. They had to have some fun in there as well. And the culmination was a character challenge. Uh, the character challenge in Park Rapids, Minnesota, they worked on team building and basically had a good time doing a lot of fun events with people they've gotten to meet throughout the summer. And uh, that one picture is a little dark, but uh, I, I think the smiles on their face says enough they were having a blast. There's a lot of partners that helped make this happen, and, and I can't thank them enough for what they did. Um, the Grand Forks Park District provided the Blue Line Club as a home base, 
and the summer passes to Choice Fitness and outdoor pools, they spent a lot of time at those facilities. Cities Area Transit provided summer bus passes to all participants. That's how they were able to navigate the city and get to the locations that they, they had events at. Uh, Thrive and Financial donated $250 for the impl implementation of the garden project. That's really what got that thing going. Acme Rents provided machinery at no charge to create the garden project space. There was a sod cutter and a tiller that they donated uh, the use of. Hardware Hank and East Grand Forks donated $150 for garden equipment. Safe Kids provided free helmets to all students and completed a bike safety training course. Gemini Custom Sports Marketing provided Impact Academy shirts. Gate City Bank donated $500 for transportation costs. Dietrich Bus provided reduced bus rental uh, rates. Wise Floral donated $250 for lunch, snacks, uh, and snacks related to the Park Rapids trip. And then the Grand Forks Fraternal Order of Police donated $1,500 for snacks, supplies, and the character challenge. All these donations were procured by Corporal Thor Lashes and Officer Farmer and other Grand Forks uh, Police Department members. I can't say enough how hard uh, Corporal Thor Lashes and Officer Farmer worked, not only to plan, organize, schedule, uh, corral, um, and, and then gather donation monies at this event. And, and so hats off to them uh, in this endeavor. The outcomes were growth. Participants have grown to be more positive peers and role models. And then of course our return, participants have found ways to give back to their community. It was very uh, um, neat to see how these groups of kids that are from different parts of the city came together and, and really had this core bond at this, uh, this uh, Impact Academy. So lastly, some of the improvements that we um, intend to implement uh, this, this following year. We plan on improving the method of participant selection. Um, an application process coined with the SRO and school staff approval. Staffing, uh, increased staffing uh, could be utilized for higher individual engagement during activities. Uh, we had two officers that took on and, and shouldered a lot of uh, responsibilities with these kids that, and I think they could use a little bit more help. Transportation, uh, the CAT system was, the, uh, excuse me, the CAT system was invaluable uh, getting us around town. Uh, however, additional transportation means would be beneficial to reduce the budgetary impact such as um, uh, travel throughout town and to the um, um, the uh, um, character challenge. Excuse me. Thank you. Uh, that's the end of it. Thank you guys for your time and attention. Dr. Brenner, it's, it's back to you. All right. I would like to uh, introduce our district mental health coordinator, Jeff Gockler, uh, who has some information to share with you. Uh, would just like to uh, provide a couple of comments before Jeff takes over. Uh, some of you have heard me say this before, so forgive me. Um, seven, eight, nine, ten years ago, when we would talk about students not knowing how to read, we would say nothing else matters. Uh, we are seeing a completely different day in education uh, over the last five, six years, um, and the conversation has switched from if you don't know how to read to if a student doesn't know how to regulate socially, emotionally, behaviorally, nothing else matters. Um, social emotional learning has risen um, to be one of the top three buckets in our strategic plan that will be finalized uh, sometime in January. And uh, as a part of that, uh, or even as a prelude to that, uh, the district recognized that it would be important to have somebody uh, be a facilitator, a coordinator um, in that type of role at the district level. Uh, Jeff comes to us with lots of experience internally as a counselor at Red River High School, and he's done a fantastic job pulling this uh, not only school district together around this concept but pulling this entire community together around this concept so with that I'll introduce Mr. Jeff Gockler. Thanks for the introduction um, and I think it's important to to note that there's a wealth of individuals and entities working on the community aspect so um, you know Jeremy just highlighted talking about how the police department has has come in and worked with the youth in the school district and how that complements one another and you know we're continuing to work work with the the students obviously during the school year in the summer but but we also wanted to take that um, I guess kind of inverse approach and, and and think about how can we also reach out back into the community and strengthen the community as well so um, that's where I'm going to focus my attention tonight so those of you on the school board I I think it was just last month that I spoke to you um, and it was kind of a um, a combined effort of you know what are we doing in the school district and in the community and, and my focus tonight will be a little bit more um, on the community aspect so um, we're referring to this as a, a Grand Forks community collaborative um, initially I would say almost exactly a year ago there was a, a meeting in my office and there was just a few of us there myself 
another counselor, and we had invited Mariah Opp from All True Tears in to talk about just our, our collective suicide prevention efforts in the community. And um, she asked some follow-up questions in how she could support the school district's suicide prevention efforts and asked if there was anyone at the district level that was coordinating those efforts. And, and when we you know, said there, there wasn't anyone at the district level coordinating kind of our mental health um, uh, team, if you will, she requested a meeting and, and out of that meeting was born what we initially called the community, Grand Forks Community Call to Action. Uh, we met with our, our three superintendents um, and, and the thought was born out of that meeting Let's, let's call together a group from the community. We, we started with our um, community partners email list, um, which I believe is facilitated by Northeast Human Service Center. Um, maybe 60, 70, 80 people on that list and, and it's grown. I just sent out a reminder this morning um, for our meeting here at City, Chamber, uh, City Hall Chambers um, day after tomorrow and I think there was just shy of 130 people on that list. So, so we've grown that list. Um, and, and repackaged ourselves as, as the Mental Health Matters, hashtag GF Cares, a Grand Forks Community Collaborative. We didn't want to um, be confused with the work that Michael Doolitz has done through public health um, with response to that initial community call to action. So um, hence, hence the rebranding, if you will. Um, when I talk about mental health, you know, I think there's, there's an immediate reaction that we're talking strictly about those with mental illness. And, and like I said, that, that initial meeting with Mariah in my office was talking about suicide prevention efforts. Just last year alone, um, there were 13 confirmed deaths by suicide in the city of Grand Forks in 2018. But I, I would like to highlight that when we talk about mental health, what do we mean by mental health? You see there the quote I've got up, um, physical health is more than the absence of disease. Mental health is also more than the absence of mental illness. All of us in this room, all of us in this community, right? Everyone has mental health all of the time, just like we have dental health and physical health and financial health, we all have mental health. And so that's really the focus of, of our group's work. Um, I, I didn't have a graphic, or I originally had a graphic here. Um, it didn't translate over um, into the new slides, but basically what it shows is two continuums, mental illness, low mental illness, high mental illness, high mental health, low mental health. Um, and basically any presentation that I go out and, and do, whether it's with students or parents or teachers, um, that's kind of the initial slide to just really clarify that. Um, so like Dr. Brenner said, for the purpose of our students, how are we defining mental health? It's this, the social, emotional, and behavioral well-being of our students. So we're talking about what, what activities, services, and supports do we need to provide um, to help our students with that. Um, and it does also include, I should note, um, substance use and um, today speaking of anniversaries today is the one year anniversary of Cindy McMillan joining the Grand Forks Public Schools as the only um, licensed addictions counselor in the state of North Dakota working for a school district so um, her work has been um, tremendously helpful um, and I can speak firsthand to that that she's helped a wealth of students and families that I've worked with so uh, we're happy to have her on board um, when we talk about what percentage of, of students and, and adults in the Grand Forks community, this is, this is a national statistic, um, approximately one in five adults, and that does extend down to youth um, from the age of 13 and up, actually, um, that have a diagnosed um, mental disorder or mental illness. So again, there's a national statistic up there, but if you apply that to the school district, you're talking about roughly 1,500 out of our 7,500 students. You know, the Grand Forks community at large, you know, you're talking about 10 to 12,000 people out of 50 to 60,000. Um, as far as the hashtag, GF Cares, um, we had a, a naming competition, if you will. Um, there were at least a half a dozen choices. The Mental Health Matters GF Cares is the one that, that floated to the top and, and serves a couple purposes, I think. A, it's consistent with the GF is cooler and the welcoming GF. Um, you know, GF cares, um, but, but it also ties in with the national organization, National Association of Mental Illness. Um, their, their national campaign is Why Care? And, and we talked about this at one of our previous meetings, and um, I'll just read a little bit from, from uh, that organization. It said, 
Caring is a simple four-letter word, but it's a powerful way to change lives for people affected by mental illness. It's an action, it's a feeling, it's a gift we give ourselves and to each other. People feel loved when someone cares. People re uh, recover when, when someone cares. Society changes when someone cares. And an entire system can change when people care. So that's, that's the mindset we're trying to embrace the entire Grand Forks community with. Um, half of all lifetime mental health conditions, you'll notice, um, begin by age 14. For example, you know, the two most common that we hear about in today's society are, are um, often depression and anxiety. The median age um, for onset of anxiety is age 11. So that puts things in perspective. Again, that's the median age of onset. So that means half of all anxiety um, diagnoses are before age 11. So um, really puts things in perspective. Like it says there, early intervention programs can help. And I, I guess I would say even before early intervention, we would talk about the need to focus on prevention, right? Everyone's well, even if they're mentally healthy, we're all gonna have ups and downs. Um, and how do we prepare um, for, those, for those times when, when the downs hit? Um, some local statistics. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for 15 to 34 year olds in our county. Second leading cause of death 15 to 44 year olds in North Dakota. Um, so good news and bad news as it relates to this. Um, the good news is um, we have not had a death by suicide, of course, in the Grand Forks schools this year. Um, that's the good news. Um, the sad reality is most of my days start by receiving um, uh, a release from from All True or Red River Behavioral Health or Prairie St. John's um, as, as I'm the one that's tasked with receiving that information and then put, assembling the team in the school district to coordinate with the social workers and the staff up at All True and the other facilities. And so um, we're, we're well aware that there are, are numerous uh, students out there that are, that are struggling, but I'm, I'm also thankful for the teams that are in place to help them recover and, and uh, to get better and to get back into the schools. So um, there's been a marked rise. I've looked at the data all the way back from 2003 to, to current 2019 in the Youth Risk Behavior Survey uh, for the state of North Dakota. Just to put it in perspective, um, I'll give it to you as a fraction. Roughly one in five students at the high school level, and this is in the state of North Dakota, but generally applies to, to Grand Forks. One in five students um, considers suicide Approximately one in seven plans um, uh, has suicidal ideation to the point where they've planned that event, and approximately one in eight have attempted. Um, just six years ago, only one in four students, not only, but one in four students said they were sad or hopeless every day for at least two weeks. That fraction is now up to one in roughly three. So again, um, there is a noticeable difference just in the last five years. Um, on, a, on a more upbeat note, you'll notice the mission and the vision that our, our community collaborative came up with. You'll notice again the, the strengths-based approach here um, in the schools. We would refer to this as kind of a tier one intervention. We all have ups and downs, right? You can read the mission and the vision um, for yourself, but I think um, I'll, I'll steal a little bit from the, from the mission statement of sources of strength, which we now have in all our middle schools and high schools. It says, all of us will go through good times and rough times, um, but our mission is to ensure that during the rough times, no one gets so overwhelmed or hopeless that they want to give up. So our goal is to spread hope, help, and strength into every corner of our community. And that's the approach our community collaborative took um, here. Um, there's a planning committee uh, with, actually there's 10 of us now. Um, I believe there's nine up on the screen. You'll see the different entities that are uh, represented. Um, Mariah Opp with All True Tears, like I said, was in on the ground floor. David Perry, that's with the Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, which if you're not familiar with that organization, I would encourage you to research that on your own. They serve a six state region. North Dakota obviously just being one of those six states, but they're right here in our own backyard and they've been an invaluable resource. I can't say enough good things about uh, David and his team there at the MHTTC. Um, Pete representing the city, and then Michael Doolitz with Public Health, and then the 10th member is Ashley Nelson. So when you talk about collaborative efforts, Ashley is interning with, with Michael through Public Health, myself with the schools, and Mariah at All True Tears, um, and that's been a nice way to keep our groups connected as well. Um, so success through collective impact. Um, 
How do we address a complex social problem beyond the scope of a single organization? Um, so we've, we've talked about this, you know, bringing these different groups together and, and certainly mental health of our Grand Forks community is a complex social problem um, that we're all in this together. Roughly 40 different um, partners um, that are represented with our Mental Health Matters organization. Um, I did bring a handout. I can distribute that when I'm done. It gives maybe a little bit more in depth about um, the four different work groups that we've got that we've kind of um, factored into or fractioned into rather. Um, one of our groups, the um, I think it's the Community Awareness Group, um, has led the efforts to um, secure a website. So we now have the domain gfcares.com and we're working to build that website as a one-stop shop, if you will, for the Grand Forks community on the supports and services that are available to our um, community at large. So again, it's a work in progress, um, but, but uh, collectively we'll get there. So um, I guess that's it. To me. Well, I have found this to be quite informative and quite helpful, so I thank everyone for what they do. And I started when I have to speak publicly, I say it's great to live in a community that cares. And it seems to be that's the case because we want to make Grand Forks a great place to live, learn, play, stay, and invest, and, and to remain. So I want to thank you for that. And part of the Grand Forks promise, one of the pillars is commitment to youth, and I think we have a good team in place with our schools. And I appreciate what you do to help us be a better community. So with that, is there other discussion, I guess? Is it Ms. Schaap? I just wanted to highlight our two student school board members. I, I didn't think that we did a good job of that at the beginning. So okay. I want to compliment Riley Thorson and Oliver Wolf um, for coming and not to shout out one over the other, but I have to give a little bit of a shout out to Riley because she has, this is her second year now on the board wow. and she is, very dedicated and they both are coming to all of our meetings so we ask for their student input uh, whenever we can and we're just so grateful to have students on our board this is our second year well thank you welcome thank you dr brenner and mr palmasino any comments or anyone anyone have anything that is good to the order Anybody have questions? Mr. Sand, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to uh, thank the school district, uh, um, uh, especially for all of the hard work related to the mental health issues that are going on in our community. Um, the leadership that you are showing is very impressive, and I personally appreciate it. Knowing that I have schools in the school system, I know that uh, it makes me feel better that you guys and, and the whole team within the school district takes it so seriously and is, is moving that forward. So I personally really appreciate it and I, I know that I speak for lots of parents in our community so thank you I think just one comment I would make is, is I've been on the school board this is my 25th year and I've just seen the changes that we've seen that we no longer just educate kids you know we, we almost get to the point of we're raising some of the kids and it, today I had the opportunity to go to Winship School and do with American Education Week and and uh, talk to the kids about, I was a graduate of Winship Elementary and four of my brothers went with us. So we were all there to, to meet the kids and it was a great experience. But the thing that I noticed is over 200 kids came to have lunch, breakfast in the morning and talking to the person putting it on, majority of those kids were on free and reduced lunches. So it's just a great setting. And, and Mayor, I told the one boy asked me when I went to Winship and I said, 1954. And he said, when was that? <laughs> so it, it's been a while. So, but thank you, Todd and Dr. Brenner for putting this together and housing us here. Thank you very much. With that, any further? With that, anyone else have anything to say? Ms. Not, to, not to steal that because that was a great story, but what um, Mr. Gockler presented I think is so important and because I am so passionate about our kids in the community, mental health is a big deal and some of it does start with alcohol prevention. And so I want to say that we need to listen to the, this collaborative approach and remember that when we're, we're planning and, and doing policies. Thank you. Well, thank you. Anything else, Mr. Phelan? Not to ruin the moment, I'll try not to, Mayor. I know. Um, 
on the first area when we talked about growth and development, I, we, um, Mayor said we should continue to stay engaged. I think that's going to be very important because I think the school district has infill development decisions to make. You have greenfield development decisions to make, just like we do. And my guess is, you know, you're going to have to balance what makes sense as we move forward. And I, I would just say for the city itself, I know we're going to probably have an, a case back here, but we're going to have some downtown projects, I think, will move forward. We're going to have some ones in and around University of North Dakota that are going to move forward. They're both going to be mixed use. I would just say they get highlighted more than all those projects that reside on Gateway Drive and on you know, on the fringe of the city. We spend millions in those areas and nobody really knows that. I'm just saying from the city of Grand Forks, because uh, we have some commentary, infill development is the easiest thing we can do from the city of Grand Forks. Because all we're giving up is potential growth that may or may not happen. To make all those other developments happen require investments in the millions. So as we get down on that road, we're similar to you. And I think we're more alike than we are different. And I think if we can keep that spirit alive and keep an open mind, I think uh, we're really on the cusp of really great things uh, in the Grand Forks community. And, and we want to keep it moving. And so that's my mission every day on Good. behalf of Mayor Brown and the members of City Council. Thank you. Thank you. Can you stand in here? Sorry. Free speech.